All right, thanks, Michelle. So uh, my talk today, and I think all of the talks are going to be very case-based in terms of using uh, some of the algorithms and personalized care in individual patient populations. And so as I go through, I'll be posing questions to the audience. And if you just want to shout out answers or kind of um, thoughts as we go along, this is meant to be interactive. Okay, so personalized care in inflammatory bowel disease, what does this mean? How do we deliver this and how do we monitor? So these are the questions we need to keep in mind when we're caring for these patients. And why do we want to have personalized care in, in IBD? Um, I think we've been hearing this already at the conference a lot that the care of IBD patients is very complex. And we, what we know of the treatment risk versus benefit uh, continues to evolve, so we're always having to uh, weigh the risk versus benefit in our patients um, in the decisions we um, help them make about treatment pr uh, programs. Um, and so there's really not an absolute standard in every patient. And there's a, a, a similarly a high degree of variation among healthcare practitioners in how IBD is diagnosed, how it's treated. There's a lot of overuse, underuse, or misuse of resources as a result of this. And uh, about 11% of patients receive care that's either not recommended or even potentially harmful. So some of the benefits on the flip side would be to optimize the effectiveness of our treatments, decrease adverse events, <clears throat> minimize cost, and this would be through trying to integrate where we can the genetic and the conventional lab testing, and then to factor in all the clinical variables that we know play a part in how the disease will progress or present. So, uh, and this does have a direct correlation with the quality of care in that we're really looking at the five rights, and I think this is a nice thing to remember when we're seeing patients is trying to get the right drug, the right dose, the right patient, the right route, and the right time. And again, therapies based on genomics and the microbiome and using biological markers that predict risk for disease or response to treatment. And then, of course, last but not least, really involving patients in a shared care model so how does this look in Crohn's? So what I've done is I, I have a patient that I've worked with for many years. So some of the things in her case, um, we didn't have some of the clinical tools we have now uh, to, to uh, implement and, and kind of revise our care. So, um, but I'll post questions as we go along about what we might be thinking about as um, we care for this patient. So she's a 22-year-old female. Uh, she presents elsewhere, not at our clinic, um, but elsewhere with abdominal pain and diarrhea, and had a colonoscopy that showed Crohn's, but I, I don't know where it is in her, if it's in the small bowel or colon. They put her on Pentassa, um, but what else would we consider in terms of testing before we actually implement therapy in a patient like this? Upper endoscopy. Some, some sort of small bowel imaging. Laboratory, Laboratory testing, absolutely. Fecal calprotectin. Fecal calprotectin, which we didn't have back then, but. Like social history, it has a lot of history. Psychosocial history, absolutely. Sometimes forgotten, but absolutely important. So. Um, and I was looking at, uh, in terms of specific testing, so uh, doing the IBD panel, so antibodies uh, to uh, Saccharomyces, um, uh, doing the P-ANCA, and uh, antibodies to CBER1 and OMPC. So um, those, of course, are just adjunctive tools, but not, not necessarily screening tools. They can help sometimes to sort out the difference between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's. So um, the same uh, patient did actually pretty well with a Pentassa, got pregnant, um, and during her pregnancy stopped Pentassa, had a healthy baby boy. Um, she remained off all medication for about 10 months postpartum and then had a really bad flare, was hospitalized again in a rural Minnesota hospital, 
Um, they gave her IV steroids. Uh, they restarted her pentasa, didn't do any kind of imaging. And <clears throat> she calmed down, but then two months later, hospitalized again, and they did do a CT at that point, and she had a very large uh, multi-loculated uh, abdominal abscess. Um, so she had to have emergency surgery, and they did a, a large ileal resection, temporary ileostomy, and left her with a mucous fistula, and then sent her to us. So, um, and she saw one of our uh, trauma and critical care surgeons. Uh, she was, at the time we initially saw her, she was still tapering her prednisone. She was smoking, so we advised smoking cessation. Uh, we recommended that she start azathioprine. However, because she was still diverted and still kind of recovering from the surgery and was having some difficulties because of the tobacco use, also, um, she had some difficulties with post-op wound healing. So it was postponed for three months. But <clears throat> one, of the, one of the thoughts is what would we need to consider before starting azathioprine? TPMT, yeah. So TPMT is just that this is one of our oldest uh, but very good uh, tool to use in terms of the dosing of azathioprine. It's the primary enzyme for metabolizing both azathioprine and 6-MP. Um, <clears throat> it's a very cost-effective way of dosing patients, um, and most will have a normal amount of the TPMT and can be dosed at the two to two and a half milligram per kilogram dose, although um, with, always remember with 6-MP, it's about half that, it's one to one and a half times, or one, one to one and a half time, one to one and a half milligrams per kilogram. About 10% have intermediate activity, and then uh, a very small percentage have really no enzyme, and they really should not even be considered for thiopurines. So um, she had a, a TPMT of 30, uh, which actually is high normal. Normal in our assay was 15.1 to uh, 26.4. Her weight is 65.8 kilograms. Uh, so what would be her dose? If any of you are math whizzes. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, yeah, probably 125 to 150. Um, so we did. We started her on 125 milligrams, and then she went on to have takedown of her ileostomy uh, six months after the emergency surgery. Um, she had no Crohn's at the time of her surgery and, uh, again, had some complications, though, of a pelvic abscess. She then got C. diff colitis. She had a toe infection. And so, again, her azathioprine was held in the perioperative period. And then uh, was restarted once uh, her, her periop period was over. Six months later, we did another CT and uh, no active Crohn's. So she was doing pretty well on azathioprine, uh, but having some psychosocial issues then at that point. Her husband had been abusive, and so we got a social worker involved with her care. <clears throat> and um, then she came back about six months later. She was starting to have some recurrent obstructive episodes, and we did a CT enterography, and at that point she had recurrent Crohn's in the distal eight centimeters of her neoterminal ileum. But we really couldn't see any ev evidence for obstruction. So we did a colonoscopy, and she had a very tight anastomotic stenosis and uh, sort of an inflammatory um, polyp and biopsies of her anastomosis showed moderate active chronic colitis, so not just anastomotic changes, but act evidence of active disease. So we thought it was appropriate to start the conversation ab about a biologic, and we did a chest X-ray and skin test. Um, but what else would we want to consider at this juncture? Say that again. <laughs> Hepatitis B status, yeah. So I think back in the day we weren't really doing that, but absolutely, Hep B. 
a trial of budesonide might have been a, appropriate. Um, the other thing I thought is, you know, the azathioprine, is she on the right dose? She had had some weight gain <clears throat> since I'd seen her. And so she, we may have been able to do the, and we didn't do this as, as part of her care, but we may have been able to do, to check her therapeutic levels to see if we, there was some room for improvement. So typically you want to see a thioguanine above 235 and then the 6-MMP less than 5,700. Um, so this can help if you have a patient that's um, not really having the expected response or who has lost response or um, it can also kind of give, give you an idea if, there's, if the patient is being adherent. So we did start her on infliximab, and um, subsequent to that, she was in the ER locally uh, for uh, obstructive symptoms, and then had a balloon dilation of her ileocecal, or her ileocolonic anastomosis. And then on her own, stopped azathioprine a year later, um, but came back, um, regularly for follow-ups, and she really stayed in remission endoscopically and radiographically and symptomatically for about four years. Um, she had some issues then with infertility, I imagine because of all of her surgeries, and um, during that time had developed a, a post-infusion sort of diffuse body myalgia and some drainage from her umbilicus, and we were concerned about disease recurrence um, or possibly an antibody uh, formation to the infliximab. Uh, her inflammatory markers were pretty normal, though. So it, is there concern here because of these symptoms that maybe she's lost response or she's developed antibodies? I mean, it kind of triggers something, but it's sort of nonspecific. And I think, I think the, oftentimes our cases, it's not really clear cut what's going on. And we have to kind of look through one by one. I mean, you have somebody, too, that got pregnant before and now is having some infertility. Is that also related to maybe some disease activity? Um, so in terms of uh, things that could affect her anti-TNF levels, obviously this is a nice algorithm. I think most everybody's seen it, but um, certain things can interfere with uh, drug levels. Um, so if there's an elevated CRP, male gender, um, if there's a high body size, if there's a low serum albumin, but she really didn't have any factors that should affect her um, levels. Um, and what would we do if, if it looked like she developed antibodies uh, to the infliximab? <clears throat> uh, we would probably end up switching her to another anti-TNF, or if her drug levels were below therapeutic, we would increase her dose. Um, so we did go ahead and do that, and she actually had... Um, uh, plenty of uh, Remicade in her, infliximab in her system, and uh, her antibodies were negative. Um, and then she went on to get pregnant, was having a lot of bloating, abdominal pain, obstructive symptoms during pregnancy. We did an MR enterography, which is relatively safe in pregnancy, <clears throat> and she had a lot of dilatation of her distal small bowel, proximal to the ilio, uh, or iliocolonic anastomosis. And we ha had a very lengthy Con, you know, conversation and, and a dialogue with the surgeon and with a high-risk OB about could we safely do a colonoscopy to try to dilate her anastomosis, but chose not to and just kind of um, uh, helped with manage, managing her pain. And then she had a healthy baby um, at uh, 37 and a half weeks and did fine by C-section. So what other concerns... Um, would you have in a, in a patient like this that's pregnant um, and potentially has uh, a blockage? What's that? When to hold the biologic. When to hold the biologic, exactly. So she's, um, exactly. So I think, again, back when she was on this, I don't think we were holding the, the Remicade or the um, infliximab in the last two months, but typically you would <coughs> hold the dose or try to avoid any dosing beyond 32 weeks. 
Um, and then she went on to um, have another uh, colonoscopy postpartum, and she had a very tight stricture, was dilated, um, continued on <clears throat> infliximab, and then had another CT uh, about a year later. She still had some mild narrowing, but no obstructive symptoms and no active Crohn's. So, um, so additional considerations. So what other things might we want to think about? Somebody that's really done well, she's an endoscopic remission, feeling well. Uh, what are some other things that you'd think about in a patient like this? Yeah, are you able to visualize all, all of the disease pre present? But similarly, how often do we scan or scope patients that are just doing fine? Um, I don't think that there's a, a real uh, guideline for that. So, I, and I think we struggle with that. It's all over the board. Some people don't do any kind of yeah. MR enterography, yeah, to look at the entire small bowel. Exactly. Some of the, yeah, non-invasive testing, inflammatory markers, now that we have fecal calprotectin, that's something we could do, too. And if she was still on combination therapy doing well, would you maybe consider Yeah, exactly. So at what point do we stop the azathioprine? And if you were going to stop one of the agents, would it be the azathioprine or the infliximab? question of the day. So that was, those were some of the questions I had too. Can she stop infliximab? Um, um, and actually she was off and on so many times with the uh, azathioprine. I think at this juncture she was off again, but would we need to add it to ensure that she continues to have response and to avoid antibody formation? Um, and, that, and then also how often do uh, people check for tuberculosis and hepatitis B? in a patient that's on an anti-TNF. I, I, you know, I have some patients that have been on it for 10 years or more. So how often do we test? Annually? So it sounds like there's a lot of differences in how people monitor for tuberculosis in terms of PPD and um, the quantifuron and the frequency of it. And um, so that would be, I think, something we don't have a good handle on either. But I think... I think that's it for mine, so I'll turn this over to...